I guess I can just get started now. So, um, yeah, I'm Liban. Uh, I've been working with uh, Dan under Dan as a volunteer for a while on like Procipus and researching it. And I've done it for around like a few years, but it's been on an on or off basis. And um, my research is generally focusing on Procipus or Methenge and um, it's specifically in East Africa. So first a brief table of contents. I'll first cover what Procipus is and um, just the general origins of where the plant came from and also uh, what it looks like and the forms it can take. Then I'll talk about its um, geographic distribution. And um, there isn't a really comprehensive map of Prospis in Kenya in total, but there are some good maps in certain areas. So I'll show those maps. Then I'll talk about the um, consequences and negative impacts that have ensued from Prospis's introduction to Kenya and also East Africa in general. Uh, and then I'll talk about opportunities uh, that could emerge from the plant and also some risks that um, one can face when they start working with Prosopis and trying to cultivate it. Uh, after that, I'll talk about um, a basic summary on how to uh, cultivate the plant and um, turn, it for, uh, turn it into charcoal. Then lastly, I'll um, look at three examples of people utilizing the bush um, for charcoal or like fuel wood. So first of all, what is Prosopis? Um, it's native to North America around the southwest of the United States and also in uh, northern Mexico. And it's a plant of many names. In the United States, it's frequently called mesquite. In Kenya, it's called methenge. In Somalia, it's called garanwa. And in um, the scientific community, it's called Prosopis juliflora. And um, it was introduced in the 1970s to combat desertification because um, in many areas, uh, there, were er there were areas that were having eroding soil. And one of the best ways to combat the eroding soil, which can lead to desertification, is to have plants with uh, very long winding and strong root systems, which Prospis has. But um, after it was introduced to combat desertification, um, it spread way faster than people expected it to, and it quickly became a pest in the region. And for its morphology, it can either be a bush, which is around three to five meters large, or a tree, which can be 15 meters. And um, here's a bush in the top left image. And in the bottom left image, you can see a prosopis tree. And it's uh, abundant with thorns that can be up to five centimeters long in the picture in the um, top right. And here's a picture of a flower from prosopis too, because when they grow their flowers, that is something that allows them to spread very quickly. So the second issue is, where is it? So ever since its introduction, it has spread extremely quickly throughout Kenya. And by 2016, which is around 40-ish um, years after its introduction, it had taken around 2% of the dry land in Kenya, which is obviously a pretty big amount, uh, which amounted to around 37 uh, million hectares. And uh, in 2009, it was actually found in seven out of eight of Kenya's provinces. So it, it was widespread across the whole country. And by now, most estimates say that it's in every single province in Kenya. And it's most aggressive in the arid lands of the north because that's where it's able to outcompete most species. And 80% uh, of Kenya's land, uh, which is arid or semi-arid, is actually at risk of invasion because it's just really good at um, conquering and spreading um, arid areas. And here are two maps. The map on the right is uh, a pretty old map from 2002 that shows prospects to spread throughout Kenya. And the regions that are like sort of shaded in with lines are the areas where they estimated prospects to be. So there's a lot in Garissa and the Bringo County too. And there's also some in the areas near Turkana. So obviously it's um, pretty widespread around different regions of the um, country. And this was only in 2002. And after that, it has spread a lot more since it's spreading at like uh, basically exponential rate every year. So this map just gives us like a basic overview of what its um, invasiveness used to look like. And um, it has definitely spread a lot more since then. And the map on the left is short of sort of emphasizing this because this is a uh, map of the Moringa subregion in the Baringo County. And as you can see in 1988, um, the Prosopis is the red part and there's almost no Prosopis. Then in 1995, you can see it's slowly building up uh, across the edge of the river of uh, the lake Then also in some other areas. Then in 2002, it spreads even more. In 2009, even more. And in 2016, it's all over the place and it's essentially just spread at exponential rate year after year. So 
this map definitely isn't giving the full perspective of its extent because even in this one small region, it has just managed to spread so much so fast in only 28 years. So it's clearly um, covering a lot more than we can see. So um, there are quite a few negative impacts that come from working with Prosopis. Um, first of all, it, it spreads extremely quickly. And this is because it can tap into groundwater very easily. As I mentioned earlier, it has a um, very long winding root system to combat um, desertification. But at the same time, this makes it so it can easily get groundwater. And that means it can outcompete species really easily. And also there are no natural enemies for it in East Africa. This is because um, it came from North America. So there's obviously no like pathogens or any um, animals that could like eat the plant to stop its spread for the most part. So uh, it can spread really easily. And even when animals try to eat the plant's pods, it actually ends up being bad for them because uh, they're very high in sugar. And when uh, animals try to eat them like goats or uh, grazing animals it actually ends up rotting their teeth because the pods are so sugary. Also, it bears fruit prolifically, which can obviously be an issue because animals will eat the um, pods and then they will excrete the seeds and then that can lead to its spread even more. Its seeds also are able to germinate and grow extremely quickly uh, when they come in contact with moisture and faster than any other species. So when there's a seed that is um, spread to another area, it's going to grow extremely quickly. So that means like people need to respond to it very quickly, which a lot of people don't have the ability or time to have to, the ability or time to do. And uh, lastly, the stems grow very quickly uh, when they're cut. So even if somebody cuts like the trunk of the plant or all the branches, it's just gonna grow very fast. And this can be really bad because if you cut the trunk of a prosopis tree, um, a prosopis bush is going to regrow in its place. And that can be even harder to deal with because it has lots of thorns and it's harder to cut. And as it spreads quickly, it ends up harming the livelihoods of many people. Um, historically, it's been able to spread out of its intended plantations really quickly. And this ends up taking up farmland, pasture land, and homesteads. So people can't plant crops, uh, have their animals grazed, or they just can't build homes in areas because Prosopis is just taking up so much space. And uh, it actually ended up being the biggest driving force between behind shrinking, shrinking grasslands and croplands in the Bringo County. It accounted for around 38% of the reduction in like um, shrinking grasslands. So it's obviously a pretty big deal. And it's not surprising that the vast majority of Kenyans that were surveyed actually want the plant to be removed because it's just causing so many problems. So uh, even though the plant brings its fair share of problems, there are some opportunities and some risks that come along with these opportunities. So people can try to like make the most out of the situation. Uh, first of all, there are some financial opportunities. The government has recently allowed communities to use Prosopis or charcoal um, in mid 2020. Uh, because Prosopis is just a very um, invasive species and they wanted people to deal with it. So this goes against the moratorium on cutting for charcoal, but they are um, proposing like the cutting or use of charcoal, use of Prosopis for charcoal. And uh, it's the third best source of income in um, communities in the Bringo County. Um, so the first um, in rural communities in Bringo County, I should specify. And there was a survey done and people said that the first and second most um, important sources of income were farming and livestock keeping. And then the third most was charcoal production, as you can see in the table in the bottom left corner, where people just like ranked the importances of um, livelihoods throughout the year and Prosopis ranked uh, third. And um, the Kenyan government estimates that there are around 30 billion shillings worth of fuel in total if all the Prosopis in Kenya was cut and used for um, charcoal. So it's obviously something that a lot of money can be made out of. And um, when people manage throughout about 300 square kilometers of Prosopis forest in the Bringo County, they actually ended up earning around $100,000 per month or 1.2 million US dollars per year. So obviously it is something that can be pretty profitable. And um, another great thing is that there's no initial capital required um, beyond the basic tools and perhaps a metal sheet or chimney to work with it. Um, so people can start working with Prosopis at a very uh, low cost, and then they can profit easily on it too. And um, the pods, which are another part of Prosopis, can actually be used for animal feed, and they can be sold for around 100 Kenyan shillings for per 50 kilogram bag. So it's also a um, another source of income that you can get from Prosopis. As for its efficiency, um, using a drum kiln for carbonization typically resulted in a pretty high efficiency that is comparable to other preferable charcoal sources in the area. And uh, there's a table right here that shows that. 
So uh, sawdust, maize cobs, rice husks, coconut shells, and acacia, et cetera, were the um, previous examples of um, uses of, or things that you could use for um, briquettes or charcoal. And Prosopis trilliflora is something that I added on the um, rightmost column. And you can see that it has a similar volatile matter, fixed carbon, and ash content. It has a pretty good higher heating value. Um, one study found it was around 21 uh, megajoules per kilogram. So it's obviously um, pretty effective. And it's like similar and almost a bit better than other um, sources of energy like the briquettes from sawdust or maize cobs. And most, it's most similar to acacia, which um, is a pretty common use or source of charcoal in East Africa. So obviously it is something that can be used and it's not as ineffective as some people might think it is as a source of charcoal. There are some risks that come um, with prospice though. The first one is logistical. There's a perception that prosopis is a uh, pretty low quality charcoal and this can lead to a lower demand. And also a lot of people don't even know that it can be used as a charcoal, which can obviously be a problem. And people might not want to buy it as opposed to like a more frequently used uh, charcoal from another plant. Second of all, charcoal prices are very volatile um, and they've been increasing recently after the moratorium because there's a supply side shortage. So obviously, um, since there's like an artificial increase in the prices of charcoal due to like the uh, moratorium, it's pretty unstable and volatile and it's obviously a pretty uh, risky venture to enter. And also it's very hard and time consuming to get the permits to produce and trade charcoal, which I'm pretty sure all of you already know. And it's also um, hard to cut the trees with machetes and axes typically because um, prospice is like a very thorny and bushy tree. So you're not gonna be able to do it very easily with the conventional tools. Uh, second of all, there's lots of environmental risks. So as I mentioned earlier, prospice spreads extremely quickly. And after people work with the plant, they typically um, don't remove the stump, which can be an issue because the plant can just regrow very fast. And then um, it will just result in the same issue. And I think I mentioned this earlier, but if people do not um, remove the stump, then a prospice tree that you cut could regrow into a prospice bush. And then that's even harder to handle. It also spreads very quickly out of its plantations. Um, so if people try to like plant prosopis and then use it as a source of charcoal or uh, any other fuel, then it could spread out of its plantation very fast and then end up actually doing more harm than good. And uh, even though in the 2000s, the Kenyan government promoted cutting prosopis for fuel, the plant um, actually propagated around the same pace, which indicates that even though people were trying to harvest prosopis and manage it by utilization, uh, its spread wasn't really stopped. So here's a um, graph of the price of charcoal uh, from 2007 to 2018. And the uh, y-axis over here is the um, price of uh, four kilogram tin in Kenyan shillings. And this is credited to the Kenyan National Bureau of Statistics. And as we can see over here, the price was like pretty stable around 2014 to 2017, but then there was a big spike due to the moratorium. And now like the prices I would say are like um, propped up pretty high and like pretty unstable. Then um, here's a um, graph of the prospice spread rate in the Bringo County. So um, this is essentially the percent rate of um, its previous amount at which it spreads. So like the prospice population was increasing by around 5% each year by 1988. Then in 2002 it was increasing by around 30% each year. And when management by utilization was started in around um, 2002, Prospice actually spread at the same rate and it slightly increased, which means that the plant is still spreading extremely quickly. And this went against expectations because people thought that it would spread slower once people started doing the management by utilization, but the rate at which it was spreading was actually slightly increasing after the introduction of this. And this is because of the reasons I outlined above. It spreads very quickly on its own and people weren't removing the stumps after they were done with the plant, which is obviously a big issue. So now for the cultivation process. So um, I obviously haven't worked with prosopis on my own before, but these are the tools that people have found to be most useful when working with prosopis. Uh, first are axes and traditional short handled axes and machetes are most commonly used and uh, European short handled axes have also been pretty appreciated too and they have been useful. And uh, long handled felling axes are also pretty helpful when it comes to dealing with prosopis too. The Maddox is also a pretty good tool um, because it can help with cutting smaller trees. And also it's really good because it, a sharp Maddox can 
dig up the stumps of larger trees and like cut up the roots when you're trying to pull it out. Rakes are also very nice because it makes it easier to handle the thorny branches. Um, you can like push and pull the branches, clear the ground, gather cut materials, and also you can like pull fallen pods beneath the low drooping branches. So it's just good for handling the plant and not dealing with the thorns. Gloves are also really nice to have. Um, strong work gloves are recommended and they're needed because the plant is very thorny and obviously you don't want to cut your hands when you're working with it. And welding gloves tended to be the most resistant, but even those only lasted a few months of daily use. So obviously it is very damaging working with the plant. And saws and loppers are um, two also pretty helpful tools. Carpentry saws can be used, but bow saws are preferred. And loppers are nice for uh, cutting smaller branches that are around two to three centimeters in diameter. And in the bottom right, we have a photo of some tools. Here's a rake, a bow saw, a mattox, and some gloves used for working with prosopis. Um, when you're working with prosopis, there's a four-step process that um, one could follow in order to um, remove the plant. The first step is cutting. Uh, it's essentially when you just cut down all the trees and dig up the seedlings. And uh, when you're cutting, the first thing you want to do is generally like make a space for you to like base your cutting operation in because prosopis grows in these very dense thickets. So you should probably cut out a small region in the thickets for you to start working in and then uh, spread out from there. And uh, you should try to cut down all the trees and dig up the seedlings because the seedlings can obviously regrow. So it's essentially just like exterminating all the trees and cutting them down. All the roots and branches thicker than your thumb can be used to make charcoal, but the thickest branches and the stumps are the best, especially the stumps they are really good for charcoal because they're like a really high quality wood. And longer branches can actually be sold as fence poles. And sometimes they can fetch a higher price than charcoal would go for. So they're another um, source of income that you could consider. The second step is clearing. So um, as I mentioned like a few times earlier, cutting prosopis alone isn't able to stop the plant spread because it's going to be able to grow back if you don't remove the stump. So there's two ways to combat this. The first of which is to remove the stump just manually with the mattox or you could burn it. And you should also try to uh, pile all the branches that you don't want to use and burn them as well. And a few burning techniques are pretty popular. One is just to get all the excess branches that you don't want to use and then put it on top of the stump and then use them to start the fire. And then that can also burn the stump. People also like to put manure on, a top, on the top of a stump and then burn it and it has a very slow burn. And that can also um, deal with exterminating the stump in a really effective way. Um, parts three and four you're probably uh, more familiar with. Um, so this is essentially the carbonization process or the loading process where um, people can use drum kilns, charcoal pits covered with metal sheets or earth uh, mound kilns or just covering mounds of soil basically. And um, smaller twigs are usually needed to start the burn and you should try to put the stumps and larger branches in the middle of the uh, kilns that you're using and try to keep an eye on the burn every day so you can uh, know when to stop um, carbonizing the charcoal basically. Then there's sacking and the burn will vary in length. It will last like two or three or a few days in a smaller pit and like 10 to 12 days in a larger mound. So um, obviously like it's gonna take a different amount of time based on how much you're putting in. And after you extinguish the uh, pit, you should leave it a few days to cool. And um, after it's cooled, you can uncover the mound and empty the pit and fill up sacks with charcoal as you can see in the image on the right. And um, I should just note that the four step process is like a pretty basic overview of what should be done when cultivating prosopis. And a lot more details are actually covered in a paper by um, Nick, I'm gonna butcher this name, sorry, uh, Pyschnik. Uh, and he works at the Pastoral uh, Environmental Network of the Horn of Africa. And he made a really good paper on managing and utilizing prosopis. And it was based on a study that uh, he did in Somalia. So now to look at some examples of working with prosopis. Um, one example is in the refugee camps of Djibouti. So Djibouti currently suffers from a drought and at the Aliade and Hol Hol refugee camps, there are around um, 23,000 refugees that had challenges with getting energy because there weren't enough um, plants for them to get charcoal from or firewood. And both camps actually used firewood that was collected from more than 150 kilometers away from the camps as a fuel. Um, however, there was a shortage of firewood and this led to people uh, leaving the camps and looking in surrounding areas to find fuels. 
But research from the uh, FAO and Djibouti government found that the efficient use of prosopis in the area could actually combat the energy insecurity and make it so people don't have to leave, run move away so far from their camps looking for um, uh, firewood. And also it can provide jobs for people as well, which is a plus. And uh, in the image in the right, you can see uh, the Ali Adair refugee camp. And um, there's a lot of uh, prosopis uh, branches and um, tree branches and stuff like that in this area. And this is just like a distribution point for prosopis at the Ali Adair refugee camp. Uh, another area was Somaliland or Northern Somalia. It's obviously like a disputed region. In 2016 to 2018, the FAO actually partnered with uh, Penha, which I mentioned earlier, to develop a project in Berbera, Odwani, and the Togdar districts of Somaliland. And they had uh, two main aims. And the first aim was to um, just create jobs and entrepreneurial opportunities. And the second one was to um, create livestock feed processing cooperatives and also create market linkages to essentially um, give people who were uh, cultivating the prosopis uh, the necessary connections to start selling prosopis to consumers because a lot of people were complaining that they couldn't find enough consumers when they were working with prosopis and its charcoal. And it had two methodological pillars uh, or like ways that they did the project. And the first one was raising awareness and capacity development. So they just essentially trained people and educated people about prosopis. Then the second part was processing, processing of prosopis into livestock feed blocks and charcoal through providing the necessary tools. So um, they just gave people tools like Maddox's and some mills to grind the prosopis pods to um, make feed and stuff like that. So they essentially just provided them with the tools and training to work with prosopis. There were some uh, impacts and they were mostly beneficial. It created economic impacts, um, created jobs and stuff like that for people, also environmental impacts. People reported that the environment was better because they were removing invasive species and also agricultural benefits because um, it opened up a lot of farmland for people to work with. And here's a testimonial from a project beneficiary who says that they used to walk over 40 kilometers to burn charcoal from acacia and then transport it to Odwene, but now they can just uh, burn it in their village and they make around 100 US dollars per month um, from postpus charcoal because they don't have to spend money on transport and the logs are available in the area. So obviously uh, it's been a really big uh, success for some people. Lastly is Sabringo County. Um, so polling found that actually the vast majority, almost everyone believed that Prosopis charcoal has promises in industry in the Bringo County. And um, incomes from charcoal in 2016 were around uh, 93 million Kenyan shillings and yearly earnings from other Prosopis products like pods, fencing, construction poles, totals around 12 million shillings, which is around 12.9% of the total earnings. So while the um, charcoal was a pretty um, profitable industry and there was a lot of money being made there, the other products of Prosopis like the pods and fencing, which I mentioned earlier, can also be used and they uh, also made a fair share of money. There were some challenges that people faced though. Um, I mentioned some of these earlier, like a lack of reliable market, price fluctuation, uh, during the rainy season, it was hard to transport things due to the poor state of roads. And there was also a lot of exploitation by middlemen when people were working with Prosopis too, which um, essentially just like made it so the consumers were paying more and the um, producers were actually having a harder time like profiting off Prosopis. But overall, um, the adoption and utilization of Prosopis products is um, contributing significantly in a good way to the livelihoods and income of the people in the Bringo County. Uh, however, the in utilization of the species has not reduced its invasiveness, which is sort of connecting what I said earlier about how even though people have um, started to cultivate prosopis in Kenya through the management by utilization process, the rate, as, the rate at which it spreads has not budged. So even though people are profiting, it has not uh, been really stopped when it comes to spreading. So um, these are my references and that concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? Thanks, Levon. That was really great. What a good overview. Um, does anybody have questions you can hand raise or maybe some of the other people on the call, um, Mary or Shomarke, want to just jump in with their own comments? So 
so uh, this is uh, Shamarki. Hi, Shamarki. Um, I thought that was a very good good presentation. Um, my only question is in terms of how do you target uh, areas that have a substantial um, growth in terms of that, like that, that have more of the trees and less of the bushes? Because I, I can see a situation where if it's primarily bushes and they're very small, there's very low wood to be harvested. It may not be as economically vi viable as an area that may have the larger trees that would offer more thicker uh, uh, bases and, and branches to use. So is your question, um, what should you do in regions that have like more bushes? Yeah, like, like how would you how would you go about sort of identifying areas that are more like that offer more opportunities for harvesting at a much lower opportunity cost? Because if it's primarily bushes, then it ends up being a lot more work in terms of gathering, cutting the cutting them down versus an area that has more established trees. That if you are to to, to chop them down, you'd probably get easier to get more wood material out of it. Oh, um, yeah, I agree that uh, regions that have a lot more. Um, Trees are definitely something that people should try to identify when they're trying to work with prosopis because as you said, the regions with bushes, like they're gonna have branches that are a lot thinner and branches that are generally like thicker than your thumb can be used for prosopis and the ones that are thinner are not gonna be able to, can be used for charcoal, I mean, and the ones that are thinner can't be used for charcoal. So I think it just generally has to do with people identifying regions that have um, a higher concentration, generally a high concentration of prosopis in general, and also um, a, a uh, high concentration of prospects that has a significant amount of field wood. And one of the other things that even though it may not be the most economically viable to deal with areas that do not have a large invasion of prosopis, it is still pretty beneficial to um, try to remove it because when you try to cultivate prosopis, there obviously are economic benefits, but you're also um, clearing up farmland, which can be beneficial and like create positive externalities for people when they're trying to um, open up farmland. So even though it may not be the most economically efficient, there are benefits to dealing with um, the lesser spread areas because those are gonna spread a lot more out in the future and become like a really big issue. Um, Liban, just to follow up on Shamarki's question. So do, do, had, when you were looking at those various maps and resources, um, did you see any that um, delineated as he was asking between what was kind of the low level prosopis, the, the, the bushes and, and where, where there were higher stands and where the higher stands located basically where they were, had been trying to cultivate it? Um, as far as I know, there weren't maps that distinguish between like um, the trees and bushes, but there were maps that um, distinguish between the concentration of prosopis. There was like one that said prosopis concentration is greater than 50% or is less than 50% in maps. And um, generally, I think when people are trying to work with prosopis, they go to the areas where it's like the most um, invasive, which is the areas where it's been for the longest. So there tend to be a lot more trees there. So typically when people are harvesting prosopis, it's the areas with like the taller trees and stuff like that, because that's obviously where you can get the most fuel wood. That, that makes sense. <laughs> Anyone else have any questions? Um, I have a question for Beatrice. Beatrice, do you see um, a lot of the prosopis in your area? I mean, or, or, or actually open to anyone just because she's working in a forested area or any of you having to deal with it and um, on your land? Uh, in our specific uh, forest land, no, but in Casigo, yeah, definitely, yeah, there are some uh, prosopis, yeah. They're invasive in some villages around the hill. So it's not uh, as huge as you can find in Tadveta or in Baringo County or in the northern part of Kenya. But yeah, yes, definitely we have some uh, prosopis. And does anyone trying to do anything to clear it or cultivate it mm. or is it just there? <laughs> they're just there. Yeah, they are just there. Yeah. I've, I've, I've seen a lot of these processes when I worked in uh, Garissa and the local county government did try to chop, chop it down. But like Liban had said, unless you are able to cut the root and destroy the root, they, it's just going to grow back. So, you know, it could be like one of those great cash for work or cash for food programs where you can have people, you know, um, 
chop it in exchange for food or, or money. But unless you kill that root, they'll come back very quickly. And um, and so what it happens is it just ends up colonizing large tracts of land that could be, have been used for farming or irrigation. And it tends to monopolize and colonize areas that are near the water points, near rivers and streams. And so that it creates thick, uh, thick, this very green thicket that makes the land impossible to access. Liban, do, what are, um, do you know what some of the um, natural enemies in the U.S. are that keep it at bay here? Because it doesn't seem to be a problem in the U.S. Um, I'm not specifically sure, but the articles that I was reading were saying like that there are like um, pathogens or like bacteria that are um, like adapted to like dealing with prosopis that exist in the United States that don't um, exist in other regions. And also there's probably just like animals that have like probably more adapted to eating the um, pods of prosopis or eating the plant in general and getting around the thorns and other animals in East Africa probably haven't done that yet because it's just been introduced. And also there's also probably environmental controls we have here out, out in North America where we have different seasons. In other parts of the world, such as East Africa, there's a constant, there may not be limiting factors in terms of cold weather that could sort of limit the, uh, the amount of growth that uh, yeah, the plants could have in any given year. Yeah, that's a good point. And also one thing I forgot to mention was um, herbivorous insects um, are also really something that can combat it. And there's a few of them in the United States. I'm not sure of their names, but in East Africa, there's like no herbivorous insects that um, eat prosopis. Hey, Liban, I have a question. Um, it's pretty simple, I guess. Uh, how do you identify it? Or is it easily confused with anything else? If I'm just walking around in the bush or something? Um, well, there's a few things. The first is it's thorns because it has really unique thorns that are larger than the average species. And also it has a um, pretty unique leaf structure. Um, I forget the name, but it has like a like the, um, the leaves like sort of split and they're very small and like they're, there's no other like plant in the area that has a very similar leaf structure to prosopis so that you can identify. And also the flowers are different. They're, I showed a picture of it and they're like very dense and like small flowers and mm. they're like clumped together and they're yellow too. So it's like generally they're, they're um, thorns, leaves and flowers are different from other plants in the region. Mm -hmm. Beatrice, you want to ask a question? Yes, I would like to know if uh, you had the opportunity to interview uh, the former directors of uh, Tinder Ecofuel, uh, especially, for example, like Fiona Maura, because they used to sustainably produce charcoal with prosopis in Marigat. And um, finally, yeah, the, the company shut down, I think it's in 2019, but um, we were sharing quite of, uh, a lot of insight, information and news following the charcoal ban in February 2018. And I know that for them, it has been uh, very difficult because they could no longer uh, even operate or transport uh, their products. I remember they used to supply a lot of restaurants near Machoma Zone uh, on Nakuru Highway and even in Nairobi. And uh, so I, I don't know, after yeah, I've not been in touch too much yeah, with, with them. And finally, they set up another company uh, in the water. <laughs> it's a water project now. It's completely different. But I remember their model. They were engaging, you know, the local community to harvest the prosopis. And uh, even I remember that they were producing with a retort kiln. So I don't know if you had the opportunity to interview them. I think maybe it could be interested uh, to get their feedback on their experience. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, could you just write down the name of their organization or their names in the chat so I could contact them? It's uh, yes, 
It's yes. Tinder, okay. Tinder Ecker fuel. Echo Tinder, fuel. yeah, Tinder, sorry for the exit. Tinder. Oh, okay, okay. Yes. Yes, sorry. Tinder. Not, not the dating app, but Tinder. No, no, no. <laughs> um, um, Dorothy, did you want to say something? Dorothy, go ahead if you have a question. Uh, thank you so much, Sylvia. Thank you, Dan, for sharing and all uh, the participants. Uh, I'm just interested in uh, knowing if Madenge, I have seen a bit of it in Homa Bay. And uh, one comment I have always had people make is a negative one against the Madenge, they say, it um, once the animal feed on them, then their teeth they lose their teeth or something like that, and they don't like it. And um, one, I'm just looking at the charcoal ban and the benefit of madenge in uh, being a source of charcoal. So my question is, uh, Dan, do you think? Uh, Prosobis or madenge can be a source of uh, feedstock for briquettes, and how can it be processed to uh, be a source of feedstock for briquette production? And uh, two, how can the charcoal, is it possible that the charcoal briquette, the charcoal project can support on the um, growing of more madenge to be used in uh, Kenya as a source of feedstock for briquettes or not because we are losing all our tree cover. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dorothy. I guess, Liban, did you, did you see anybody who was in your research? Did you see anyone who was making briquettes specifically or mostly with methenge people would make um, just regular charcoal. Do you know? Um, as far as I know, people are mostly making charcoal. However, um, yeah. in previous research I did, there was work with briquettes. Um, mm -hmm. And they, I thought the briquettes, as far as what I have found, were like pretty good. Uh, in one study, I think it was in Kenya, they used anthill soil as a binder for the briquettes. And um, it performed pretty well. And one good thing about the briquettes is that um, Un, unlike charcoal, which can only be formed from like the thicker branches, briquettes can be made from the thinner branches too, which means yeah. that you can utilize more of the plant. So maybe Dorothy, if if the uh, methenge bushes or the growth of methenge in Homa Bay area is not as old and uh, matured, then maybe the size is more suitable for briquettes. But it seems like if it's larger in size, then it could just be made into charcoal. You wouldn't need to take that step to crush it and then repack it into briquettes, um, which maybe isn't necessary. And then, in, yeah, Shamarka, you got to want to add something there? I've, I've actually seen these plants in uh, first hand. It's, they're extremely hard to harvest. So I think you mm. have to figure out ways of incentivizing people. It's not like cutting, it's not like cutting an acacia tree, which is much easier, which will give you a higher yield for, for less effort. This is like really, really hard work to harvest it. So I think at some point it's going to require some kind of incentives, whether it's uh, working with the, with the uh, county government or getting some exemption at the uh, central government level to harvest these fuels. Short of that, it becomes very hard, at least from a from the government's policy view. It's hard to sort of differentiate between the process of charcoal and the charcoal that comes from other trees. So you have to find ways of uh, creating uh, an environment, uh, regulatory environment that allows the harvesting of the process. Thanks, Morgan. I think also Dorothy. Uh, I'm not sure, but it, from Liban's research and and speaking with some other people. I don't think it's smart to promote uh, growing more methenge uh, because like Libana said, it, it um, can grow uncontrollably. It's, it's very difficult to manage. And um, it seems that there's already quite a lot uh, even to try to remove or control 
as it is. So I don't think one of the recommendations is to actually promote planting and growing more. Because uh, like Liban said, there's not those natural um, consumers or predators for prosopis uh, that exist elsewhere. So would you agree, Liban, Shamarke, also Mary? Uh, yeah, I'd agree with that. And it's especially bad in um, some regions that the government has actually uh, decided to like make it illegal to intentionally plant prosopis because it just spreads so quickly. So yeah, I'd agree with that. Sylvia, could I say something? Yes, please, Mary. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, I think from the many studies that have been done <clears throat> on prosopis, uh, the research is all uh, heading to one direction that uh, we really need to manage it and control its spread. So that's like the direction that uh, would be good to go. Uh, because as the presentation has showed is that, um, you know, just utilizing it doesn't control it, doesn't eradicate it. And therefore uh, the interventions of managing it and the complete removal that has to be a, priori uh, a priority. And then that understanding that it's there and it's a resource. And therefore people can make use of it. And uh, you know, for different things like the presentation highlighted uh, for energy construction materials and whatever. And you know, it's, an, it's a fertilizer tree it fixes nitrogen. So the areas which have been cleared off becomes gardens with fertile soils, you know? And uh, so we need to really come up with very good integrated approach that we are controlling, eradicating, removing it, as well as utilizing it. No planting, that's illegal, that's criminal. Nobody should ever think of planting matenge. And uh, the, there was the issue of whether utilizing it for briquette is something to go for. We have a project in Baringo where we have been training farmers to produce charcoal from eight. And we are starting from manage the wood rod by thinning, you know, remove some branches, leave others to grow. And a branch of five centimeter in diameter is good enough and good quality for charcoal. But then there are all these small residues that are left that people now can carbonize and make briquettes because that way then you get into the circular bioeconomy. You are using a resource to its last mile. And so we have been training people, they are producing charcoal, but the whole challenge of transporting charcoal and issues like that because of not identifying sustainable charcoal versus this other conventional charcoal is a charity. I saw some uh, briquette initiatives that not, not actually, uh, some briquette initiatives in the rural areas. And that is becoming a challenge for market. So we have to be able to look at, if we are going the charcoal, charcoal is okay. It has a system that is established. What we need to do and possibly that is what this project can think about going forward is how do we establish briquette value chains such that uh, possibly the charcoal dust that is coming from this prosopis, if they process into briquettes, where are they going to sell? I've seen a lot of briquettes in the rural areas, but th th there is a gap between where they are produced and where they are utilized. So how can that be bridged that they can, we can have some traders who then go for briquettes in the rural areas or alternatively, we have the briquette producers, how can they source charcoal dust? 
Because we have some people who say charcoal dust has become so minimal in urban areas. So these are the areas they could get the charcoal dust. So they, we established a value chain of sustainable briquette uh, sourcing raw materials. And then it come to the urban areas, it come to the people where they are producing briquettes. Thanks, over to you, Sylvia. Um, thank you, Mary. That gave us a lot of ideas. And um, I think, um, I think that um, we'll, we'll need you to make some introductions for us. We do have some people in the group who are just distributors. So they are you know, generally looking for briquettes to distribute. And then we do have people who are looking for char dust on a regular basis. Um, mm -hmm. So making mm -hmm. those connections, I, I agree is really important. I had one question for you and then we'll, we'll let Saeed ask a question. Are there any commercial not commercial or larger scale government efforts to clear the, the methenge? I mean, it seems like it's difficult, but if you had a bulldozer, um, you know, if you had a big entity uh, clearing a large area, it, it doesn't seem like it would be that difficult. Um, uh, as far as, oh, you can go ahead. No, it's okay. You can go fast. That's all right. Okay. Uh, as far as I know, um, I haven't seen a lot of government efforts to deal with it. I know in Somalia, the government said that they wanted to remove the plant, but they didn't get to it probably because there's like a lot of things going on there with their own government. There's like a bit of instability, but um, like in Kenya, I know that there, the government has usually promoted management by utilization where they promote like businesses and people to cut down the plant on their own. And um, in 2000s, in the early 2000s, I think they really started promoting this plan where they would um, essentially just like help businesses cut down the proceeds on their own. So there hasn't been like really an effort at mechanical eradication, which is what I think you're trying to suggest as far as I know. And it's probably because it's really expensive since it covers like 37 million hectares of land. So um, wait, yeah, it just covers so much land that it's just very uh, hard to deal with in general. It does like seem through though, a mechanical approach. It does seem though, like if Mary said, once you clear it, you have this nitrogen rich, rich soil that um, it it would, it, it might be a good opportunity for a community um, that's looking to expand their agriculture. But it's just a thought. Go ahead, Mary, you wanna to add to that? Yeah. Um, I haven't also seen very large scale, you know, like large scale with the tractors, mechanical control or with chemicals. I haven't seen that, but there is one uh, model that the government is using at the uh, Kefri, Kenya Forest Research Institute in Lodua. And the government is working with the community at the projects and they are clearing huge spaces you know, like uh, really removing it, cutting it and burning the stumps. Mm -hmm. And then the people are using that for growing pasture. There is receding of pasture and some portions they are using to grow dry rad crops like uh, sorghum. So uh, yeah, there is some efforts on really clearing it and it's like restoring pasture and agricultural rad, you know? Um, and then they're doing that. But also there are some portions that they're establishing some good belts of the prosopis woodrad. So managing them for charcoal or construction materials because we don't want the dry rats again to go back to where they were that there is no cover again. So we have to be very careful in uh, eradicating it. So there are belts that they are leaving like green belts of prosopis for these uh, biological products and other ecosystem services. I, I, I can give, I, I'll share the email of the person I know working on this in Lodua. Great, that'd be great, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, just to add something really quickly, um, going off what uh, Mary said, in uh, Kenya, I think the government really was just going for the management by utilization approach where they trained communities to essentially just um, uh, harvest prosperous trees and then use it for charcoal and then reseed the reclaimed areas with like um, grass species and other things to like sustain livestock or maybe start farms there. So uh, the government was generally going for like the approach 
of um, having the people deal with it. And there wasn't a, much of a mechanical, mechanical eradication as far as I know. Saeed or Shamarki, do you want to add anything? No, I think Mary explained it very well. You need some kind of government intervention, intervention whether it's policy or uh, support to do this because um, otherwise it becomes very, very hard to, because it, requ it requires some kind of policy advisement, especially um, getting the inputs, uh, managing the land sustainably. Um, I could see it could work if there was some kind of uh, support also coming from donor communities to sort of create projects that, that help clear this land in exchange for you know, labor service provided or in, in the goals of creating more sustainable um, farmland for local communities to, to utilize because this tree has become a pest and it's, and it's taken over the most prime land in, in all of these communities because it tends to colonize areas that, that, are, that are quite easy to colonize that have water that traditionally would have been used as pasture or as farmland by these communities. But once these trees take a hold, this area becomes uh, inaccessible to everybody. Um, well, well, thank you, everyone. Um, do, does anyone else have any further comments or questions for Liban? Mary, do you have anything else you want to add? Uh, no, I think that is, uh, that, yeah, like, it's good to go forward with, uh, you know, like, very integrated approaches and uh, you know, really targeting it, uh, reducing its spread completely and eradicating it and creating space, you know, we, we need that because people in the dry run where it is, they really need food, they need pasture and it's a big scare now with climate change implications uh, that uh, its niche is expanding with continued degradation from climate change, then it's spreading further and further. So I think projects around this is really timely, really timely. And actually the government of Kenya is developing a strategy on prosopis specifically. So it's easy to work with the government and also under the bioenergy strategy, it has a component on uh, managing and neutralizing prosopis. Thanks, over to you, Sylvia. Yeah, thank, I mean, to me, it seems like it sounds so difficult uh, uh, to manage and to kind of leave it in the hands of individual, individuals really to manage is, is seems a little too um, optimistic. So um, yeah, I think a government supported community program or um, maybe an NGO supported community program, something that brings resources um, to the clearing part of it so that at least that part of it is, is um, aided uh, seems like the best way to go. Um, it, it sounds like you'd have to be super disciplined and hardworking to be able to get, you know, to, to adequately clear it and remove the stumps from your own land, um, which, you know, as everyone knows is, is <coughs> um, but um, anyway, um, well, this has been a really great presentation and I really appreciate everybody joining in and Mary and Shamarke and especially mm -hmm. Liban for um, leading the discussion. It was really informative. Um, I think we're gonna end it there today. We, 